no one will fit. <laughs> so, uh, but there are a lot of other reasons to, to, to seriously consider this lifestyle. And he can explain all of that, but he can also explain steps in that direction. Uh, we're going to be live streaming this, so when we take Q&A at the end, we're going to be running around like Jerry Springer. With the microphone, we want you to speak into the microphone so that people on the live stream can hear what you're saying. And then we know what you're talking about. But remember, there's a second session tomorrow, so we will, we're going to keep the ship running on time today. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Barry. I don't know. I, I guess Jeff's answer fine. That's fine. Hey, guys. Thanks, Jack, for having me back. Jack's ditched this one, didn't he? Yeah, he's not in here. Okay. I don't blame him. I don't blame you. So today I'm going to be talking about... Uh, more of the theory behind a proper human diet and how it applies to you as the people that I think that you aspire to be. Who, who in this room wants to be prepared for whatever comes, good or bad, whether times get bad or whether they don't, right? So I'm going I'm to help you understand today why the keto diet. I've heard it a million, right? I'm going to help you understand why this actually matters. This is very damn important. Okay? This is not some weight loss fad. This is not some, that's not what this is. If you're looking for that, go somewhere else. Okay? So PhD stands for proper human diet. Now, since the beginning of recorded history, emperors and kings and dictators have fed their slaves and prisoners a specific diet. You know what that diet consists of? Rice and beans. And when you get tired of that, you have beans and rice. Soy and wheat. They feed you high carb, nutrient void foods that are easy to grow, very cheap. They keep you from starving to death. Which, you know, if you have slaves and they starve to death, you kind of lost your labor force, didn't you? So they want to keep you alive, but in no way do they want to optimize you, and right? In fact, the Romans used to cut one of your Achilles teal, he, uh, tendons so you couldn't run away. You can still work. You still, right? You can still dig a hole and, and use a hoe, but you couldn't run away. You couldn't, you couldn't rebel. And you, I also, my theory is you can't rebel on a diet like this either. You're fat, you're lazy, you're mentally foggy. You're, did I mention lazy? Mentally and physically, you're not, you're not motivated. You have no desire. You're just like, whatever. I'll just sit here and eat Doritos. It's fine. No worries. It's not that bad. I'm sure, you know, it could be worse. So, but a proper human diet is not about preventing starvation. So if you're in a starvation situation, eat all the rice and beans and soybean and wheat. Eat all that because it will keep you from starving. It works great for that. But if your goal rather is optimization, then I would opine that you avoid this end of the spectrum. And you'll notice there's several spectrums here and they all overlap. So if, if you want to be a slave, then eat this stuff. As you move on this direction of the spectrum, you're going to wind up eating things that are nutrient dense, that our ancestors have eaten for the last 3 million years. My apologies to any young earth creationists in the room. You can be a creationist and believe in evolution at the same time. That is possible. It's probably actually intellectual, but we, we, won't, we won't belabor that. You're gonna be eating things that humans have eaten for the last 3 million years that are nutrient dense, that contain all of the things that you need to be an optimized human being. There's a very short list amino acids to make protein, fatty acids to make myelin sheaths, to make brain tissue, to make nerve tissue, and to store some fat because human beings are the fattest primate on the planet. And we're designed that way. We're supposed to be, we're supposed to have that fat. The average woman should be from 15 to 25% body fat. That's normal. That's not overweight. The average man should be 10 to 20% body fat. So when you see these guys on the cover of Muscle and Fitness and you can see their vascular vascularity and their abdomen, 
that's not normal. That's also not optimal, but it does take a good picture. So you need <laughs> amino acids, fatty acids, vitamins, and minerals. That's it. That's literally all you need. Where's Jake? You see in here? There he is. So for this presentation, I'm going to use Jake as an example. That okay, Jake? Okay. <clears throat> now, the, what, it, does anybody in here disagree with me? Is there something I should add to this list? What about phytonutrients? How many articles and news stories have you heard about phytonutrients? These, thing, these things are essential, okay? Now, that has a specific definition in human physiology. If an amino acid or a vitamin or a mineral is essential, that means, number one, you must have it, or you will get sick, suffer, and die. The end. End of the story. Also, it means you cannot make it yourself in your body. So you have to get it from your diet. To anybody know the list of essential phytonutrients? Yes, sir. There's nothing on it. It's zero. That's right. There's not a single essential phytonutrient you hear about all the time. Oh, kale's an excellent source of phytonutrients. That's horseshit. That's what that is. Okay. There is no such thing as that. That's a that there is. I'm sorry. Well, yeah, for your for your carrots, if you want to eat some. Okay. So what we all aspire to be as being people who are prepared is we want to be this, don't we? We want to be anti-fragile. We want to be more than resilient. If, if things go bad, it's hard to break resilient. But if things go bad and you're anti-fragile, that's actually a good thing. You're like, oh, I'm glad the economy went to shit because I was prepared and it actually helped me be wealthier, right? This spectrum applies to health, nutrition, economics, finances, life, family. It applies to everything. You never want to be on this end of the spectrum. But many of you in this room right now are currently right here. You are fragile. Okay. Now, speaking from a nutrition and health standpoint, how do you know I'm fragile, Dr. Barry? Okay. I, with 21 years of experience, can tell by looking at your ass <laughs> from across the room. Fragile, fragile, fragile. Okay. Now, if you have, if you currently have type two diabetes, hypertension, fatty liver, if you're morbidly obese, have a BMI over 30, if you're eating the standard American diet, or if you're taking a handful of medications, I'm sorry, I still love you, but you are fragile. And when this shit inevitably hits the fan, which it's who who thinks it's not gonna, with what's going right, right, okay, do you want to be on this end of the spectrum, or do you want to be here? <clears throat> Not only do you want to be, but where do you want your family members and the other members of your tribe or your clade or your group or whatever you guys call what you do? Do you want to have a bunch of members who are fragile? Or do you want everybody to be at least here, if not over here? <laughs> right but wouldn't it be awesome if you could take this person that you love dearly who's here right now and help them move in this direction yeah and that's what a proper human diet does because when you stop eating like a slave or feeding your family like a slave and you start to feed them real ancestrally appropriate human foods they move this direction naturally effortlessly unconsciously. You don't even know what's happening until you put your pants on and your fucking belt's too big. Again, right? Non-scale victory. That's what we call that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, sometimes you have to get your ring resize. Sometimes you have to buy a, a smaller shoe size because you thought you were just fat and really a lot of it was inflammatory retained fluids, right? So, now, if you're normal in America, currently, if you're normal, then you have prediabetes. You probably have several markers of metabolic syndrome. You probably have prehypertension, and you're overweight or obese, okay? In America, currently, you kind of classify as resilient if all you got going on is you're just a little overweight, okay? But to be here, <clears throat> you've got to have all of these markers normal, 
And if uh, everybody write this list down, if your doctor hasn't checked this list, this is mandatory the next time you go. And I'm going to tell you a trick about how to force your doctor to order these tests, even if they don't want to. Would you like to know how to do that? So hemoglobin A1C, C-peptide, fasting insulin, waist to height ratio, waist to height, waist at the belly button, not down where your belt is, Jake, at the belly button, okay? Triglycerides and HDL cholesterol. If you go to your doctor and you give them this list and say, you can check whatever you want to check, but I also want you to add these. If they say, oh, I don't know what that is. I wouldn't even know what to do with it. That's a classic reply. How many have heard that? I wouldn't even know how to interpret that, right? Or, no, nah, it's not necessary. You don't need that. Your insurance won't pay for that. Any of that horse shit that they tell you, you're going to say the following. Are you ready? <clears throat> Doctor, I, I, I appreciate your, your intelligence and your training. I am very worried about my metabolic health, and I'm trying to improve my health. And I feel like these tests will help me do that. And you, you refuse to order them. So what I need you to do, doctor, and you're going to say this very respectfully, perhaps even lovingly, you're going to say, would you please document in my permanent medical record that I'm worried about my health? And I wanted these markers to help me because I've been doing my own research and that you refuse to order them. Could you document that in my permanent medical record? And then I'd like a copy when I leave today for my records. Yeah. Who owns a business in here? <laughs> if I said that to you at, at your place of business with regards to what you do, what would you do? You do anything I wanted <laughs> you to do. Because immediately a doctor is going to hear malpractice when you say that. They're going to be like, fuck. <laughs> and they might give you a little more grief, but then they're going to order the test. And that's all you really wanted anyway. And then you're going to thank them profusely. And then you're going to proceed when you go back for the lab follow-up and you got your numbers, you're going to proceed to teach your doctor why these tests matter so that they can help all their other patients. And then you just made your entire community, every patient that doctor sees, you just moved him a little bit, didn't you? Because now he's like, shit, see, peptide and fasting insulin are important. I had no idea. I'm going to start checking that on everybody. You just improve the metabolic health of your entire community. You think that would benefit you in a survival situation if everybody around you was healthier? So you're part of a, a, a group, a prepper group, survival group, whatever, and you're currently here. <clears throat> now, we all know that human psychology changes in a shit hit the fan situation, right? You stop worrying about niceties and you stop, stop worrying about politeness, right? You're still a nice human, but shit's got to get done. And we got places we need to be and things we need to do, right? So when you got this person who's, they've ran out of their medications and they're still eating a slave diet and their blood sugar's 490 and their blood pressure's 190 over 100, and they feel like shit and they can barely move because their joints are so inflamed. Do you ever want to be that person? Right. That's true. But do you ever want to have to be the guy? Right. You get me? You understand? And so that's why it's important now while there's still some time. To, to, to whatever you need to do, whatever kind of uh, dip, diplomacy you need to use, you need to talk to the people you care about and the people that you'd like to go through the rest of your life with and say, look, I love you to death, but your fat ass is probably going to get left behind. It's probably what's going to happen. Okay. And I get to say fat because I used to weigh 297 pounds, so I don't need any crybabies saying, no, it's not nice. Okay. Because that's, that, that's how, that was the self-talk I used and that's what helped me. So maybe it'll help you too. So these are the, the markers. Now, when you've got, if your A1C is high, you're pre-diabetic. If it's a lot higher, you're type 2 diabetic. This is completely 100% reversible. If any of you guys have an elevated A1C right now, you can fix it. Who's fixed their A1C? Got it back to normal. You working on it. Yeah, that's right. More hot dogs, more chicken wings, less bread. You got it. It's going to happen. No, not for you. You'll probably have to have a little insulin. It's okay. That's okay. But once you've got all these numbers right, you're, you're here. 
And that's a very powerful place to be. Does that make sense? So this is not fat shaming. That's not what I'm doing here. I'm trying to effectively save your life. That's what, that's what I'm trying to do here. So how are we going to get rid of these things or at least drastically improve these things by fixing your diet? We're going to do this with this thing. This is the carbohydrate knob. Okay, when you're eating a standard American diet, you're eating somewhere between 200 and 350 total grams carbohydrates a day. By definition, that's what you're going to be getting. They're very nutrient void carbohydrates. They're very inflammatory carbohydrates. They are they immediately spike your insulin, which makes you store fat. It's just that simple. This is not rocket surgery. Okay, it's just that simple. So figure up how many carbs you're eating a day and turn down the knob. Some people can go to 100 total grams of carbs a day, do great, perfect. That's That's their sweet spot. They feel great, look great. All these numbers are normal. If that doesn't work for you, turn it down to 50. If that doesn't work, turn it down to 20. If that doesn't work, then do like I do and keep it as close to zero grams a day as you can possibly get. And that's that's where I have to stay, somewhere between 10 and zero grams a day to have all these numbers normal and to feel good. That's what I have to have. And uh, I think your your DNA, your ancestry matters to a certain degree. Your age matters, your hormone status matters, probably your gut microbiome matters. All that stuff matters to some degree. But the main thing is this control right here, that control knob. If you're not in control of that, then you're eating this and you're falling somewhere over here. And you don't want to be there, okay? Now, all of these guys will tell you to eat a plant-based diet full of whole grains, lots of fruit smoothies right? And we trust them blindly with everything else they say, don't we? So we should also trust them when it comes to diet. Because I actually made a video and I, I, I put it in my Patreon group first. And I said, you guys watch this because Nisha was like, fuck no, do not post that on YouTube. <laughs> That's what Nisha Berry said. So I put it in the Patreon group and I said, hey guys, is this is this too much? And it was about 50-50, like, mm, that's a lot. <laughs> yeah, but basically, if you wanted to subjugate a society with diet, if you wanted to lower their testosterone, if you wanted to raise their inflammation, if you wanted to raise, make them diabetic, make them fat, make them where they could still do their little job from nine to five, right? And then go home and get in the recliner. And the recliner, by the way, would be the sexiest thing in the house. They wouldn't be interested in anything else. Then feed them this diet. That's literally all you have to do. And, and, and convince them that this stuff's bad for you. It's high in cholesterol. right? It'll cause cancer. It'll cause butthole cancer. So don't eat this. <laughs> right? Yeah, bad for the planet. You're going to kill the planet. You're going to kill the baby seals eating the meat. Okay, stop that. Right. Do you understand my point? Why would they be so enthusiastic about recommending a plant-based diet? Why is it that damn important? When, you know, cars and airplanes, that's 80% of the greenhouse gases by any estimation. There's no doubt about that. But you want to focus on cow farts. That really, that's what you want to focus on. So anytime you've got somebody telling, giving you a message like that, that's clearly incongruous and anachronistic and you're like that doesn't make any sense at all but you're the world health organization so i guess you know what you're talking about that's a red flag that you need to start thinking for yourself so when you turn this carbohydrate knob down when you go to 100 that's low carb 50 to 100 that's low carb and like i said for some people that's all you need to do you can still eat lots of keto friendly carbohydrates right green veg, berries, real food, real food that if you took it and time traveled back 100,000 years and you gave it to your 20th great-great-grandfather, he would be like, hell yeah, let's eat. Okay, but if you took that any any of this food back in time, your grandfather wouldn't touch that unless he was, unless he was starving. What did Jack say about the fish out there? When they get hungry enough, they'll change their eating behavior, won't they? They'll start being top feeders, even though their mouth is on the bottom of their body. 
They'll learn how to eat at the top of the water when they get hungry enough. And when any mammalian species that you gets hungry enough, you'll eat whatever. Okay. But if your goal is optimization, normal numbers, feel great, look great, perform great, and not be this guy who wakes up one morning and the tribe's gone and they've left you or they've put you on a, an iceberg to float out or they've, right, you understand? Don't be this guy. Now, if you're currently this guy, it's okay. We still love you. But what I'm here to do is to give you hope and knowledge. This is not a permanent condition. I don't care how old you are. I don't care how overweight you are currently. I don't care any of that. None of that matters. You can move this direction regardless of any of those things. Now, you may not be able to get to, it's completely anti-fragile if you're 112 years old and you weigh 549 pounds, but you can definitely move this way. And that could be the literal difference between life and death. Let's do some questions. Another question, raise your hand. Oh, I'll let you go first. I'm going to hold it for you. How much uh, does exercise uh, weigh into, into a lot of that? Good question. Did I mention exercise? Nope. Now, <laughs> let me be very clear. There's a reason I didn't mention exercise. That should answer your question, right? But exercise is great for you. It's great for you in hundreds of ways. But that's not, it is not the, the answer for any of this, okay? But you need to be strong. You need to be fast. You need to be muscular. You need to have endurance. You need all that stuff. And to get that, you got to exercise. But if you're currently a type 2 diabetic with high blood pressure and a fatty liver and you weigh 395 pounds, do you need to join the gym? That's fucking stupid. That's a waste of time and money, and you're going to tear your ACL, right? Because it's not time for that yet. You've got to fix this first. Then when you get about right here, guess what happens? All of a sudden you feel like, does this happen to anybody who previously hated to fucking exercise? But when you got, when you move this way enough, you're like, you know what? I think I'm going to go outside and play. It's a pretty day. I'm going to go out and go for a walk. I'm going to go out and do whatever. All of a sudden you feel like it. And then you start to do it naturally because exercise is play if you do it right, right? And as a kid, did your mama have to ever force you to play? No, you played your whatever your game was, right? It might have been Atari, but you still were playing. <laughs> but exercise becomes play when you feel better enough. I was wondering if you had inadvertently left out a couple of markers, perhaps, uh, cholesterol or LDL cholesterol? And if not, what was the reason you didn't put those up there? Yeah, good question. So is there any research in existence on the planet Earth that shows a causative relationship, meaning this causes heart attack and stroke? Is there any research on the planet that proves that? There is none. There is none. This is a lovely scapegoat if you are an emperor or a dictator or a president or the chairman of the World Health Organization to say you are eating too much of this stuff. You need to eat more of this so you can lower these two. And these people will invariably ignore all the markers I told you that are the markers for metabolic health. They'll, they'll ignore those and they, all they want to talk about is, are these two. Who's doctors like that? All they want to talk about your cholesterol and LDL. And you're like, but doc, I, my triglycerides used to be 300. Now they're 50. They want to hear that. I don't care. I don't care. You need a statin. Right? Yeah, but doctor, my, my A1C used to be 10. Now it's 5.1. You need a statin. And you need to eat more whole grains and drink more fruit smoothies. Right? This is a smokescreen. Okay? My granddaddy would call this bullshit. 
<laughs> that's what this is right here. This is bullshit. This is the real deal. This is bullshit. Okay. And that's quickly becoming apparent. Any, any healthcare provider who looks into this, they quickly realize that. They realize that these are the markers. That's it. If these are normal, I don't give a damn if your total cholesterol is 150 or 450. I could care less. It's irrelevant. Your body will put that right where it needs to be. What percentage of your total cholesterol in your blood does your body make? Not that you eat, but that you your body makes it without your permission. 80 to 90 percent. You can eat all the egg yolks you want and drink all the heavy cream and eat all the butter. Your body's going to put your cholesterol right where it needs to be for your optimal health. The end. Okay. My total cholesterol is about 350. That's what it runs on carnivore. LDL is about 250. I'm not concerned about that at all because all these markers are perfect. Hi, hey, Dr. Perry. Uh, my sister-in-law is about 18 years old and has had type 1 diabetes for a couple of years now. Mm -hmm. um, how would a diet change in this way help her out? Mm -hmm. Great question. So type, type 1 diabetes makes up 5 to 10% of all the cases of diabetes in the U.S. and the world, roughly. So it's not talked about nearly as much. Type 1 diabetics do not make insulin, right? So they have to inject insulin. Even if they, ju even if they just eat a carnivore diet, they still have to inject a little insulin. So the way it's going to help your sister, your sister, is that what you said? Sister-in-law. The way it's going to help your sister-in-law is she's going to use 80 to 90% less insulin over the course of a year. Now, if you, if you have to pay a copay for your insulin or you have to buy it, it's expensive as hell, right? So she's literally going to save 80 to 90% on her cost of insulin, syringes, all that junk. Number one. Number two, what happens to type 1 diabetics who don't control their diabetes when about the time they hit 30, 40, 50? First of all, they don't usually live past 50, right? They start losing eyesight. They start losing kidney function. They lose a toe, and then they go blind, and then they lose the lower part of their leg, and then they're on dialysis, and then they lose up to the knee, that's what happens to type 1 diabetics who are eating a slave diet, okay? Because they have they eat 100 grams of carbs in one meal. They have to match it with a huge bolus of insulin. Why do I want you to check your C-peptide and your fasting insulin? Why is that important? Because if hyperinsulinemia is just as dangerous as, as high blood sugar, if not more so. Some people think it's even more dangerous than high blood sugar. So if your pancreas is having to make lots of insulin because you're eating so many carbs, that's doing damage. Or if your pancreas makes no insulin, but you're injecting exogenous insulin, that's going to do just the same amount of damage. Does that make sense? So she, she from eating a proper human diet, is going to get to live when she's 40, she'll still feel great. All her, all her parts will work. She'll still have all her parts. She'll be able to see you when you come over to visit instead of being blind. When she's 50, she'll still be alive and still have all her parts. Uh, she needs to look up Dr. Bernstein. He has a book called The Diabetes Solution. He is a type 1 diabetic who figured out low carb decades ago. And nobody would listen to him because he was just a dude. And he got so pissed off, he went to medical school. True story. He was, I don't know, he's in his 30s or 40s. He was like, fuck all y'all. I'll just go be a doctor. Then you'll listen to me. And he did. He went to med school. And he's now in his 80, late 80s, still kicking, still cooking, still making YouTube videos like a teenager as a type 1 diabetic in his 80s. That's what your sister-in-law can expect from a proper human diet. I actually got, uh, I'm going to pull a jig and do two questions okay. uh, on the vitamins and minerals. Uh, I'll read off a list and kind of tell you what, what you think about the general supplement. Uh, Liposomal vitamin C, turmeric, curcumin, glucosamine, chondroitin, MSM, vitamin D3, K2, omega-3, magnesium, zinc, uh, NAC, CoQ10, quercetin, resveratrol. And then my second question is after I've lost 40 pounds, I got a lot of excess skin. Yep. What happens to that? Yep. So I got a YouTube video about loose skin. It's called fasting. How, what's the longest anybody in here has ever fasted? Three days, Three days five days, 30. 30 days. Okay. 
Who has never in their life, and it's fine, we all love you here. You can you can be honest. How many of you guys have never went more than 24 hours without eating something your entire life? It's totally fine. Okay, now, in a survival scenario, if you have to eat every two hours or you get lightheaded and dizzy, Okay, if you've never done a three-day fast, just water only, or black coffee, unsweet tea, if you've never done a three-day fast, you can stop calling yourself this. Now, I don't mean you have to do it regularly. You need to do it one time, because fasting is a, a superpower. If, you, if you've never done it, you don't really understand. But after you fasted for 72 hours, you feel a little bit like an Avenger. Am I right? It, I just got goosebumps because it's the it's the closest I've ever come to feeling a supernatural feeling, a religious feeling, a, a, a that kind of thing, right? It's it, you don't understand until you've done it, and you need to do it once so that you know you're not going to die. Because for those of you who've never went a full day without eating something, you you unconsciously, at least if not consciously, you think you'll die if you don't eat for one day. You think that's it? I'll just die. Yeah. Okay. So all the vitamin, all the supplements you mentioned are completely and totally unnecessary and a waste of money, except for potentially the vitamin D. Did you say CoQ10? Yep. Yeah. Oh, after the age of 40, you might need some CoQ10 iodine. Every other single thing you mentioned, you either don't need it all. It's a complete waste of money, or you can get it in spades by eating a proper human diet. Organ meat. 100%. That's right. Yeah. Thank yep. You. Yep. That answer your question. No, you just saved me. A hundred percent. That's right. And now you can use that money to buy better quality meat yep. and to, to increase your preparedness in other ways. Yeah. Hey, doctor, you say uh, meat, you mean poultry and fish as well or. Yeah. So human they're Okay. And so I'll talk about this more tomorrow, but, but have you ever heard of paleo anthropology? This is a scientific discipline where they study very ancient fossils mainly. Right. Cause and so what, what they've been able to do through a test called stable isotope analysis is they can look at the teeth, if there's any joint uh, tissue left, and then bones as well. They can tell you exactly what they ate. But people outside of paleoanthropology have no idea about, they don't know that this, we literally can tell you, did these people eat C3 vegetables versus C4? Did they eat millet and amaranth and, or did they eat corn or did they eat wheat? You can tell that from 500,000 years ago. You can tell. Did they eat meat? Did they eat seafood? Did they eat ruminant meat, red meat? Were they carnivores or were they super carnivores? And if you talk to a paleoanthropologist, they'll tell you that there's no debate. Humans were super carnivores before about 20,000 years ago. We had the 70% of our daily food intake came from meat and we would eat some veg. Yeah. But never was that we ate veg and a little meat. Meat is a side. That's a modern invention. Something happened about 12 to 13,000 years ago. People aren't really sure what happened, but it changed our entire environment. Some people think it was an asteroid. Some people think that we hunted the big megafauna to extinction. Nobody knows for sure yet, but it ha we had to develop farming. We didn't discover agriculture. It wasn't an invention that, that whoever invented it was proud of, okay? It was either start growing wheat or die. That was our choice. Used to, in America, in Texas, there used to be camels. Did you know that? There used to be horses. Yeah, horses. The Spaniards didn't bring horses. The horses were here, but then they died out 12, 13,000 years ago. There used to be an armadillo that was as big as a Volkswagen. There were mastodons and mammoths, both two different things. There was another kind of elephant that was in the United States. Okay? Huge, fatty animals were everywhere. That's what we lived on. And we can tell that from the stable isotope analysis. Okay? So when somebody says, well, humans are supposed to be vegan, 
you can hit the unfollow button right there because <laughs> they literally do not know what the hell they're talking about. Now, if we were in a starvation situation, would yeah, hell yeah, we'd wear this out. We'd be eating grass. We'd be eating the, the stuff growing on, on Jack's pond back here. We'd be we eat all that. But if we had our choice, we ate fatty meat. So chicken, yeah, chicken's fine. And I think a lot of people DNA-wise do better with seafood, fatty seafood, okay? But for me, it's ruminant meat, which would be cow, sheep, goat, venison, water buffalo, antelope, caribou. That's, that's what I do best on is ruminant animals. And there's specific reasons why I think that is. But chicken's fine with the skin on and the bone in. Any kind of fish is fine. Any kind of thing that runs or swims, you can eat it 100%. Hey, I <clears throat> appreciate your work. Um, and I use that to talk to a lot of the people in my tribe, my close tribe, and I get a lot of pushback. So my question would be, since it's really hard to not let the perfect be the enemy of the good for people who uh -huh. have a lifetime uh -huh. of uh, uh -huh. sugar addiction. And I'm a big proponent of that, a big fan of that concept. So it's, it's, it's hard to tackle the whole thing. If you had to pick one of the three, because I think there's three major things we have to deal with, um, it's going to be fasting. So closing your fasting window, would that be more important? Would reducing the uh, carbohydrates, specifically the processed sugars, be more important? Or would it be cutting the vegetable oils? Um, out of your diet. If you had to pick one of those three to start with, which one is going to have the most impact on overall health? Until you get these three things out of your diet, you can forget about fasting. You're going to, uh, two, two to four hours after you eat, you're going to be hungry again every time. And fasting sounds like a, a bullshit myth that people talk about, but don't really do. Because you cannot fast on a high carbohydrate diet. And uh, you have to have so much will, willpower or come to my house and let me lock you in my basement. Then you can then you can fast. That's called starvation, right? Okay, uh, but so I love the concept of don't let better be the enemy of good, and that's very common for humans. We and you'll hear carnivore people out there say, "Oh, it's this or nothing, this or nothing, this or nothing." That's fucking stupid. Okay, I do best right here, but that doesn't mean you're going to. It doesn't mean it's necessary for you. Some people, I think, it's necessary to be here. Some people can be here. This is a spectrum. Remember, this is not, Oh, it's this or nothing. Some people seemingly define here. It's called, you ever heard of this? Tofi thin on the outside, fat on the inside. These people will be slender, but they have just a little bit of belly pooch. And if you do a DEXA scan, they've got a huge amount of visceral fat in their belly, but they don't hold fat anywhere else. Part of that's genetic, but these people are, these people are fragile, even though they're slender. So it's not just about your body size. Okay. So that's why I talk about the carbohydrate knob, because this has got an infinite number of settings, doesn't it? If whoever in your tribe that you love and care about are currently eating 300 total grams of shitty standard American crap carbs a day, and you get them to turn that down to a hundred total grams of more ancestrally appropriate carbs that your great grandfather to the 50th power would be like, Oh yeah, that's food. I'll eat that. Is that a huge victory? Huge victory. Understand that very clearly. That's a huge victory. Uh, if someone just goes gluten-free and they feel better from that, you're not going to be the keto police and be like, well, actually, you know, you're not going to be that person. You're going to be like, that is freaking awesome. I'm so proud of you. And then you're going to gently, respectfully, diplomatically start helping them make the next step as they move on this spectrum, on, move on all these spectrums, right? And so just to get somebody low carb, under 100 total grams a day of good, healthy, real human food carbs, huge victory. And for some people, that's all they need. Anybody in here, as long as you keep it under close to 100, you're, boom, everything's great. It, it, there's multiple factors why that's possible for some of us and definitely not possible for others. Some people need to turn down the knob more. Some people need to turn it down more. Some people need to turn it as close to zero as they can get it. Okay. If you're on the live stream and you have a question, please put them in all caps. We'll do our best to see it. Here's the next question. Hey, Dr. Barry. So you discussed the uh, 72 hour fast. Uh, just out of curiosity, somebody who's sitting on the fragile end of the spectrum, what's the longest they could fast starting today? 
before you'd have concerns <clears throat> about their safety. Or ah, good question. So now if you're, if you're currently injecting insulin, you're going to have a problem if you try to fast and keep using the same amount of insulin. So type one diabetics or type two who are currently using exogenous insulin, they need to talk to their doctor and get things sorted before they try to fast. They need to follow the, the American Diabetes Association guidelines until they're off the insulin or until if they're a type one, until they figured out the ins and outs of how to lower the insulin as they lower the carbs. Because when you're fasting, that's a zero carb, isn't it? Also zero protein. Yeah. And so they're going to have low blood sugars. But now for everybody else in here, if you're not a type one diabetic and you're not on insulin, Jake, stand up. Now do 20 jumping jacks. No, I'm just fucking with you. <laughs> if I took Jake and I kidnapped him and I locked him in my basement and said, guess what, Jake? I'm going to help you learn how to fast. I'll see you next Thursday. <laughs> Would Jake die? No, no. How many days, if I gave Jake water and I'm going to give him pond water because I want him to have his minerals and electrolytes. <laughs> I'm not going to give him tap water. I want him to have all his, his minerals. How many days could Jake live in my basement just with water only and not die? How many days? We'll just have to find out. Yeah, yeah, Jake could fast for 21 days effortlessly now he would be ravenous for the first 48 hours yeah. after that the hunger hormones would adjust and he'd be like it's weird i haven't eaten in three days i'm not really hungry but i'm very mentally clear and i'm going to use that mental clarity to break out of this fucking basement and kill <laughs> dr barry <laughs> okay so if you've never went more than four hours without eating again better is the enemy of the good what if you tried to fast for eight hours and you did it and you didn't die? Is that a victory? 100% a victory. That's a victory. That's something to be proud of. And then in a few days, when you get your courage up, you're going to go for 12 hours. And now if you're eating a high carbohydrate diet, it's going to be very, very hard to fast for that over 12 hours. You're going to suffer miserably with hunger. But as you lower the carbohydrate knob and you move in this direction, it gets easier and easier. How many people have found that out and just naturally? If you're eating keto, you, you'll forget a meal. And you'll be like, fuck, I forgot to eat breakfast. Oh, well, I'm not hungry. Whatever. Let's go. Let's be more productive. I got time. But if you're eating high carb, that's not going to be that easy. And so that's why I, I recommend starting lowering the carbs first. And once you're about somewhere in here, you can start doing 12 hours, 14 hours, 16 hours, and it literally, you're like, this is freaking easy. Right? So I must get that Loud. Wait, stop. <laughs> oh, sorry. Yeah. Got a process got here. One, two, three, four, three. Can you dispel the myth that if you go carnivore, you're going to get scurvy? Yeah. 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 So the, 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 a lot of people are big believers in vitamin C. And if you're eating a high carbohydrate diet, you definitely need lots of vitamin C. You maybe even need to take a thousand milligrams as a supplement because glucose and vitamin C go into the human cells with the same transporter. Oh, now you're like, wait a minute. I feel like that logically leads to some other conclusions. So as you lower the amount of carbohydrate intake, all these receptors are open now. And so who, who knows that there's vitamin C in fresh meat? Repeat after me. There is vitamin C in fresh meat. There is lots of vitamin C in liver. Not a thousand milligrams, but if you're eating a low carbohydrate diet, if you're eating fresh meat and organs once or twice a week, you're going to get all the vitamin C you need. After I was carnivore for two years, I had my vitamin C checked. It was right in the middle of normal. The normal range is right in the middle. Now, that shouldn't be possible. I should have scurvy, right? Because I haven't eaten, literally eaten a citrus in shit three, four years now, right? But I'll go for months without touching a single vegetable of any type. 
definitely no fruit, but I don't have scurvy. How's that possible? Is it possible that we've been taught incorrectly about a lot of this nutritional stuff? There are carnivores who have been strict carnivore for 20 years. They don't have scurvy. So, and that's why, that's the mechanism is the vitamin C and glucose use the same receptor to get in the cell. And so if you're eating a lot of sugar, you got to have more vitamin C to compete for that receptor. But if you're not eating a lot of sugar, any little bit of vitamin C you get is going to be taken right into the cell and used like it should be. Vitamin C is a big antioxidant, uh, right? We hear about that all the time. Well, glutathione is something that your body makes naturally. You make a lot more if you're eating a lot of meat. And it's, it is the ultimate antioxidant. It makes vitamin C run home and cry to its mama. Okay. So also you don't need as many antioxidants if you're not eating inflammatory oxidizing things, do you? Okay. I have one from the live stream. They want to know how does having hypothyroidism mm -hmm. impact your ability to fast? It doesn't affect your ability to fast in any way. Now you might have, uh, it might be harder for you to fast you might have uh, more symptoms. The My my wife, Nisha, hi, Nisha, uh, has Hashimoto's and was becoming hypothyroid. And when the first time she tried to do a 24-hour fast, she also did it the week before of flow. It was a terrible decision, and she felt, she felt horrendous. She felt terrible. And she said, I'm never fasting again. That's stupid. That's dumb. I'm not doing that right? A few months later, she's like, I'm going to try that again. And she did. And she got to the, she got to the Avenger stage. She went, she went 24 hours and she was like, I feel like I took a limitless pill. Remember the movie? Limit. That's what she was like. Oh my God. And she was literally just like knocking out her to-do list, like some kind of maniac. So it makes it a little more challenging, but in no way does it make it dangerous. In no way does it make it impossible. Um, I actually have two questions. Um, one, uh, what would be the uh, longest that you would recommend fasting as an everyday choice? And then secondarily, where would you recommend that for research junkies that we would go to find reliable research to share this information with others? Yeah. So it depends on your body fat percentage, how much fasting you need and how much you can get away with. So Jake is a little fleshy, un poquito, <laughs> right? So Jake could fast for months, literally. If he had water and salt and minerals, he could fast for months with no ill effects whatsoever, okay? Uh, somebody very slender here could fast for a few weeks. And when, you, when you've run out of your, your body fat stores, you start to break down protein, don't you? Now. Is your body an idiot? Yes or no? No. The human body is the most brilliantly conceived creation or evolution that any of us have ever seen. It's not stupid. So a lot of people say, oh, if you fast, especially if you have hypothyroid or this or that or that, you'll start to break down your, your, your muscles. Think about it. That'd be like if it turned off really cold here and we were all trapped in here and it was Kim below and Jack's like, we got to build a fire, cut a hole in the roof and we're going to start burning stuff. And so instead of burning the scrap lumber, we went and got Jack's living room furniture and started breaking it up. We'll burn that for heat when he's got lumber just laying around, right? That'd be idiotic. That's the same concept as your body burning your muscle, but eating up your muscles when you've got stored body fat. So if your body fat percentage is 10%, if you fast too long, you'll start to break down protein. Yes, definitely. But if you got body fat, your body's not an idiot. It's going to burn the body fat for fuel before it ever starts digesting your liver and your eyeballs and your muscles. Okay? If, if the body worked that way, we would be extinct because it used to be commonplace. 100,000 years ago, you might go for a week and not make a kill or make a catch. Tough shit. You either die or you adapt. That's it. And the human body adapted. And it actually now uses fasting as a repair, right? Autophagy, mitophagy, all these things, right? So a good resource to start is Dr. Jason Fung's book. 
about fasting in that he's got hundreds of references that you can look up. And then on all my fasting videos on YouTube I, at the bottom, I always have multiple research resources that you can look up and study. So the next time somebody says something ignorant, like, Oh, if you fast more than 24 hours, you'll digest your muscles. You can be like, <laughs> yeah. And hit the unfollow button because that's dumb. Jake. Um, so if I'm, uh, in this kidnapping experiment. Yes, sir. Back was, to that. Jake's I, in my basement again. So I, was I already fat adapted on a low carb diet or was I coming off of the sad diet? Yeah. Cause it, does, it, does it, cause it matters if I'm, if I'm already fat adapted, I can go through a, a fast and no, yep. no sweat. Yep. So fat adaption is a, is a thing after decades of living on a high carb diet, your body gets used to burning sugar. Right. And it can still burn fat, but the mechanisms kind of get paused. I kind of get, you know, just like a tool you haven't used in 20 years. It's going to be rusty. It's back in the shed somewhere. You got to go look for it. Same kind of concept. When you start eating lower carb, that machinery gets pulled out. It gets dusted off. It gets oiled up and it starts running again. And you start burning fat for fuel. So Jake's right. If I locked him in my basement and he was used to eating a prisoner diet, it would suck bad. He still wouldn't die. Damn it. He's you, you can't kill Jake. Right. But so he would become fat adapted very quickly. But during the first 72 hours of that, it would suck real bad for him. He would feel miserable. Right. But if you took one of your friends in here, who's been keto adapted, let's call it that because on Facebook, if you say, Hey, I think that you're fat adapted. What Facebook hears is you're fat. And then they block the comment. So say keto adapted. Don't say fat adapted on social media or they'll block you because they think that you're fat shaming. But when you're keto adapted, if if I locked you in my barn, you would literally laugh. You'd be like, that fucker's in so much trouble because I could do this for weeks. And I know that the longer I fast, the more mentally clear I get. So I'm going to get out of here and I'm going to stab him. That's just that's what's going to happen. And that's, that's the superpower part of this I'm talking about, yeah. right? Think about it. A hundred thousand years ago, we're in our little tribe, wherever. And, uh, Jack comes back and it's like, I didn't kill anything today. Okay. We fast. Now, if the truth of fasting is that for every hour you don't eat, you're, you're degrading and falling apart and you're digesting your muscles. And then the next day, Jack came back and said, I still didn't kill anything today. So we fasted again. After how many days of that would we literally just be laying around in a low blood sugar coma? We could, they were fucked. We, we're done. After the third day, my blood sugar is 40. I can't even stand upright without getting lightheaded because I haven't eaten in three days. The human body is not stupid. The longer you fast, the more mental clarity you get. Okay. Athletic performance can actually increase the longer you fast. It's a superpower. It's not something that makes you weaker unless you're still eating a sad diet and it's going to make you feel like shit for three days. Okay. I wouldn't recommend starting that. I'd recommend just start lowering the carbs. Then when you get to a certain point, you can start intermittent fasting effortlessly. Hello, Dr. Barry. Oh, hello. Thank you. Um, so we have two major holidays coming up real soon. Mm -hmm. In our family, we also have several birthdays coming up and all these occasions tend to be huge carb fests. Sure. And, and so there's a psychological factor to this too, mm -hmm. for, for those of us that, that maybe are just getting started on this in mm -hmm. the last few months, mm -hmm. yep. uh, that, that, uh, that both your body wants these things. It's, it's, it's part of the family celebration. Sure. And, uh, and if you're in my case, 90 days or so into the carnivore lifestyle, mm -hmm. is it suicide to go back and partake of any of this? No, I think it's actually a, a good learning experience and you'll hear a chuckle from anybody who's learned from it. <laughs> Okay. Now two, two concepts to, to, to use to answer this question. First of all, since we've been recording history, do human beings feast? We have feasts, we have holidays. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. Religious used to be all religious, right? Now it's whatever, you know, we celebrate, we celebrate every day. Hey party. It's like for what, why are we celebrating? I don't fucking know. We're just partying. <laughs> Yeah, right. Yeah. So let's just get, get drunk and hot. 
So now the, the second concept is when, when the fruit got ripe a hundred thousand years ago, what did we do? We ate that fruit. When we found a honey tree, what did we do? We ate that. Yeah, we got lots of stings and we ate lots of honey and we laid around in a sugar coma for three days around the honey tree. But how often did those things happen? Once a year, twice a year, three times a year. And so my answer to your question would be, looking through the ancestral lens, is enjoy your Christmas and your Thanksgiving with some common sense. So have a, you don't want to hurt mama's feelings. So have a little piece of her pie because you know she, she'll cry if you don't eat, you know. Have a little bit of this. Have a little bit of that. But at the same time, remember, this is real. This is a real thing. And on a daily basis, the majority of your year, you're going to be eating this. You're going to be eating this. You're not going to be eating this. Right. And I didn't even put the really shitty junk up here because I think we're all all grown ups know that ding dongs and Twinkies and Doritos. That's stupid. I don't even have to say that. Right. So, yeah, uh, with in moderation, you're going to enjoy have a few more carbs at Christmas and Thanksgiving. I think that's perfectly ancestrally appropriate. Is it going to slow down your progress? Yeah, for a day or two. Right. But what's what's going to happen is after you've been really keto adapted, and really hardcore clean keto for a few months. And you do, you're like, ooh, bam, sweet potato casserole and coconut pie, right? And you eat that shit. How's he going to feel for the next two days? It's going to be a great learning experience. Because either you win or you learn. That's the two options, right? And you're winning right now in keto. But when you, when you lose that Christmas day, you're going to learn. And that's okay too. That's also a victory in a different way. So the feedback your body gives you will let you know without doubt that is not the proper human diet. But you still made mama happy because you ate a little piece of her pie. And so instead of a piece of pie like it used to be, you're just going to have a little piece of pie so you don't do too much damage. But I think it's fine to feast every now and then. Yeah. Okay. Our daughter's 24, type 1 diabetes, been diagnosed since 10. Uh, recently she's put herself in the hospital three times the last two years, actually recently, three weeks ago. Um, we've been through everything. We've tried everything to try to shake her out of it. She's even had to have surgery on her eyes because she's getting these blockages in her eyes. Yep. Yep. She's already started. She's doing permanent damage, right. permanent damage that can never, ever be undone. And I'm, I'm not, I'm, yeah, I don't know you guys. I'm not being mean to you, but do you understand? This is not a joke. This is not a game. She will die in the next few years. If she's already having retinal damage, the, ret, the, the retinal arteries are the canary in the coal mine for diabetics. If she's damaged in those arteries, she's damaging the arteries in her kidneys and in her heart. And we know all this. It's like, do you yep. just um, yep. my my other question is she's she's tried the keto diet. Mm -hmm. She did the keto diet for like three months. Yep. Then she went on vacation, got off of it. Yep. Because she went off the keto diet, it spun her into acidosis and sent her back in the hospital. So now she's so now she's no. Oh. Sorry. Is the question how to interact with her? To help her see the light. What do I do as a parent? Yeah. Yeah. How Now, how old is she? 24. She's 24 years old. So what is she? She's a, she's a grown-ass adult. Yeah. Okay. So first of all, you guys definitely need to try to have a, a loving diplomatic effect. But she's a grown woman. She's, she's still your baby. But she's not your baby anymore. Does that make sense? So all you can do is give her the information, maybe share a YouTube video, definitely send her a copy of Dr. Bernstein's book, The Diabetes Solution, The Type 1 Diabetic Doctor. Because if she'll follow him, she'll live to be 90 years old and keep all her body parts. But if she keeps doing what she's doing now, and probably some of the doctors she saw blamed her diabetic ketoacidosis on her eating keto. Am I right? 
It's very common that they'll do that. And it's like, because they rhyme keto, yeah, the keto diet, ketoacidosis, ketosis. They're the same thing, right? Any doctor who says something like that literally needs to be kicked in the nutsack. <laughs> Not even just a full on sprint drop kick punt right in the crotch because that's the dumbest shit. That doctor has forgotten every bit of human physiology they ever learned. They're basically acting as a priest at that point, repeating religious points. That has nothing to do with science or human physiology if they said something like that. You're going to have to keep teaching her, keep trying. Always come from love because it's not going to be good if she doesn't. Well, do you know what her last A1C was? Yeah, see, it's, I'm, I'm just telling you there's a, there's a, tra there's a tragedy right up the road. And I, I'm not trying to make you sad, but I am trying to make you think outside of this box because you're, to some degree, handcuffed because she's a grown-ass woman in another state. But at the same time, she's your daughter and you love her more than life. you got to figure this shit out. Does she have a friend or an aunt or a sister or brother? Because she may not want to hear from y'all, right? And the first thing y'all got to do is you got to lead by example. When she sees you, sees a Facebook picture of you, uh, sees you for the holidays, she needs to be like, what the hell happened to you? Okay? So make sure 100% sure you're leading by example, number one. Because if you're not leading, then you're not leading, are you? Does that make sense? And then secondly, you've got to figure out a ninja strategy so that she's not hearing it from mama, hearing it from daddy, She's hearing it from her friend or she's hearing it from her aunt that she always kind of wanted to be like because she was really cool. Whoever, whoever that person is, that's who needs to talk to her. Maybe her current spouse or, or whatever. I don't know, but you got to figure it out because you're going to lose your daughter in a few years if, if you don't figure it out. I'm, I'm going to add a comment here. I, I had a friend, alcoholic of 14 years, give up alcohol. And... Um, one thing that really helped was we all gave up alcohol with him and, uh, that's, and that's active lead, that's strategies. Leading like, by example. Th this is an alternative that I'm drinking that helps meet the carbonated need of a beer, for example. So for what that's worth. Yep. hundred percent. That's why I said you got to lead by example. If you're not, if you're not walking the walk, first of all, ain't nobody going to listen to you. If you're not walking the walk, makes sense. Yeah. Is it safe to have to do intermittent fasting with kids? It is a hundred percent safe. So let's we'll we'll talk about is it safe? Is it necessary? Okay, let's go back in time a hundred thousand years. Jack didn't bring anything home today. What what happens? Do the kids get transported to the future so they can go to the convenience store and buy some Doritos? <laughs> no, they just don't eat either. Right? Second day, what do they do? They just don't eat either, right? When we make a kill, we'll obviously feed the kids first. But yeah, so it's 100% safe. Now, is it necessary for kids to fast? If they're morbidly obese, you might implement some degree of daily intermittent fasting. Like, so they would have a, 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 a 14 or a 16 hour fasting window. And then you would not portion control at all. And that's another beautiful thing about proper human diet. You don't portion control. You don't calorie count. You eat till you're fucking full, and then you quit eating. Okay, so when during their six or eight or 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 ten hour feasting window, it's not a feeding window; it's a feasting window because you're going to eat till you're full. They get to eat as much as they want during that window if they're morbidly obese. But now, if you got a normal sized kid or they're a little chunky, there's no point. You don't need to even worry about intermittent fasting for them. They just need to they just need to be somewhere between here and here, and they'll be fine. I have a follow on question uh, from the online stream. Somebody asked, does keto work for kids under 10? <clears throat> so I said early, earlier that paleoanthropology makes it very clear without doubt that humans were super carnivores up until about 20,000 years ago, right? So if you were a human child, if you were, if you were three months old, 100,000 years ago, what did you eat? Breast milk. I'll help you out a little bit. If you're three months old, you ate breast milk. And when your mom weaned you back then, it was, they're probably weaned them about three to four years of age. What was the first bite of food that got put in your mouth? 
the very first food that you cut your teeth on. Meat. Yeah, 100%. So there is no lower limit of age where you shouldn't eat a proper human diet. And that's part of the reason I named it this is so that people would stop asking me dumbass questions. <laughs> can I eat keto if I don't have a gallbladder? Right. So it, now just imagine, can I eat a proper human diet if I'm a human and I don't have a gall? Yes, bitch. <laughs> Are you a human being? If the answer is yes, then there is no exception, okay? So uh, the first bite of food Beckett ever ate when he was four and a half months old, he had two little teethers. He could set up by himself, unsupported. He could pick up stuff and put it in his mouth. And if you know anything about baby lead weaning, that means he's ready for solid food, right? Babies have a built-in hardwired gag reflex and choke reflex. They're not going to choke to death on a, a common sense piece of real human food. They're built to eat that or to gag it out. They have defenses against choking, right? And so I, had, I was eating a beef rib, a little bit of meat left on it, and he was wanting it. He was like, eh, eh, eh. I'm like, here you go. And his, his, his grandfather, who's Puerto Rican, and, and his grandmother, they both shit their pants. <laughs> <gasps> Can you see that in your mind? That face and that body is involuntary. Oh my God, he's going to kill the baby. And Nisha, is a, she's a smart girl. And she was like, yeah, let's see what he'll do. And he gnawed every bit of meat. Of He was eating the cartilage off the end of the bone. When he got done with that beef rib and he dropped it on the floor, our dogs didn't even want it. <laughs> he had cleaned that rib up so much. And so there is no lower limit of age where a human being should not eat a proper human diet. Does that make sense? But you'll hear all these things. What if I'm breastfeeding? What if I'm pregnant? What if I don't have a gallbladder? What if I don't have a thyroid? What if my baby is, you know, whatever, whatever, whatever. And so the question is, are you a human being? If yes, you're welcome. That's it. Right. Yeah. If I've got a torn Achilles tendon, can I eat keto? If, uh, if somebody has alpha gal syndrome, yep. Um, obviously they still can eat poultry and, and fish and eggs. Are, yep. are there any, um, <clears throat> extra considerations <clears throat> that they should have? So alpha gal is, is an allergy. You can get to red meat if you're bitten by a certain kind of tick and it's not a hundred percent, um, your fate. If you get bitten by this tick, it happens. Sometimes it doesn't always happen. Alpha gal is a temporary thing. And so you're just going to eat seafood and eggs and poultry and other stuff and avoid red meat for a few months until your immune system gets back to normal. Then you go back to eating proper human diet. Yeah. I've heard you talk about rice before, but I can't remember exactly what you were talking about. I have somebody before you. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Oh. Um, any reason why dairy is in the middle and not the end? Yeah. I mean, I was getting pretty excited about getting a dairy cow. So Yeah, okay. Let's talk about that. So I think it's good to have a dairy cow. I think that's good, or several. Who drinks milk? Let's just let's be very common sense about this. Baby mammals. Why do mammal mothers give their baby mammals milk? So they can grow and gain weight as fast as possible. Anybody disagree with that? Good. Thank God. Okay. Now, the fat, there's three macros. There's protein, fat, and carbohydrates. <laughs> it's good, right? That happened, that happened organically on a, YouTube, on a Facebook Live. And Nisha was like, did you do that on purpose? I'm like, that shit just come to me. I don't know, right in the, just in the moment. So that's just regular milk. Now, if you homogenize the fat, I think that's very bad. Very, very bad. If you pasteurize it, that's bad. But I think the homogenization of the fat globules, I think that's really, really bad. Is raw milk better than store-bought milk? My answer would be it's, I think it's less bad for adults. It's less bad, but it's still, it's not an ancestrally appropriate food for an adult 
mammal to drink milk. No mammal on the planet drinks milk as an adult unless human beings give it to them. Ever. Ever. And life finds a way, doesn't it? Always. So if milk were really a great nutrition source for adult mammals, there would be some kind of weasel or possum or raccoon that would have adapted so they would sneak in and they'd be sucking titty milk from some other mammal, right? Can you imagine the raccoon sneaking up to the cow in the barn, and <laughs> right? But no mammal does that. And that, to me, I think is a red, that's, a, that mean, that's meaningful in this vast world that we got where life always finds a way. That uh, all the animals that have starved to death, not a single one have ever thought, I could sneak in the barn and suck titty milk. <laughs> and not a single one has done it. I think that means something, okay? So the three macros, lactose, galactose, pure sugar in milk, right? Pure sugar, no, no ifs, ands, or buts. Very inflammatory. It glycates your proteins much more than glucose, okay? So when you start talking about hemoglobin A1C, that's glycated hemoglobin. That's what, that's what you're measuring. Fructose and galactose glycate proteins much worse than glucose, okay? Now, the other is protein. So bovine protein is formulated specifically for baby cows, right? And so I don't think it's appropriate for even adult cows to drink cow milk. And I definitely don't think it's optimal for hu human adults to drink cow milk or any milk for that matter. Now, I, I freaking love milk. So you have to understand that. I'm not an anti-milk guy. I freaking grew up. I used to drink a gallon of milk a day in high school because I wanted to be big and muscly. And I thought that's how you did it. And I would drink a gallon of 2% milk every single day. My grandmother, I thought, was going to die because I'd be like, yeah, we need more milk. And she had to buy more milk. Now, the third macronutrient is fat. And this is why I think it's good to have a dairy cow because the, the fat in dairy is very, very healthy. And so we can separate out and we can give the skim milk to the pigs to help them gain weight and get fat as quickly as possible. And then we can enjoy the butter and the ghee or the heavy cream in moderation. That, and that's the problem is that milk is made to make mammals grow quickly and gain fat. That's its number one and only goal. So why would you want that? And, you, and a lot of people say, well, I drink raw milk and I drink a gallon a day and I don't gain any weight. Well, there are a lot of people who eat the slave diet or they live on <clears throat> ding-dongs and Cheetos and they don't get fat. We call them tofi, right? Because if you check all these markers, all their markers ain't going to be normal. And this is, this is what uncovers the final piece of the puzzle. You'd be like, hey, I'm skinny. I'm fine. But are you, though? Because until I see these numbers, I don't know if you're optimally healthy or not, do I? And if you if you got somebody drinking milk as an adult, guarantee you one of these numbers is going to be high. Or their inflammatory markers going to be high. Every, every time, without exception. I've never seen an exception to that, even with raw milk. But I do believe raw milk is less bad than store-bought milk. Okay, this is going to be the last question, and we will have a second session tomorrow. So keep your questions or see Dr. Barry after. Can you talk about the impacts of um, processed, so like bacon, sausage? Yeah. So the word process is a loaded, politicized word, right? How, how, what is the processing involved in making canola oil? <laughs> It involves a chemical factory, right? Okay, so that's one definition of processing. So how is, how is bacon, how is that processed meat? How, lo how long have humans been making bacon or, or curing meat? How long? 7,000 years, okay? You, you put salt on it. That's the processing. Okay. Now it might be a nitrogenous salt, but it's it's a salt, right? So we've been doing it for seven thousand years. It literally you throw some salt on the meat. That's the processing. Are those two things the same thing? So the processing that goes into making Doritos versus the processing that goes into making bacon. Literally, the bacon is still a whole grain meat. 
you can see the grain in the meat, right? I mean, it, it, people, they got to stop. This is fucking stupid, calling bacon processed meat. I mean, at least they could talk about spam or something. Then you'd be like, well, it is ground up, so I guess it makes a little more sense, right? But when you add salt to cure meat, and then you call that processing, and you act like bacon is just as bad as, as, as Cheetos, that's fucking stupid. Either you're ignorant or you're, you have evil intentions, depending on where you're at in society and where you're at on the IQ scale. You're either stupid or you're trying to hurt people. Does that make sense? Yeah. To call bacon a processed food is the height of arrogant ignorance. That's what that is. You are a, you are a woke, tree-hugging crunchy plant lover if you say those words out of your mouth hole and i'm i'm all for hugging trees i love trees but come on, There's another struggle on the right exactly <laughs> exactly all right so we'll do this again tomorrow and i'm going to get in more into the details of the actual how you're going to start wherever you're at right now how do you start moving towards a proper human diet and how do you start moving this direction that's what we'll talk about tomorrow. And with jazz hands. <laughs> Thank you. We'll be back in 15 with uh, Underground Networking.